Today is November 10th, 2020. My name is Ken Shi and I'm with the Houston Asian American Archive. Today we're interviewing Dr. Ellen G, who is a professor at the uh, Columbus State University. Thank you so much, Dr. G, for joining us. I'm glad to be here. Yep. To start, can you share with us where and when were you born? I was born in um, 1962 in Astoria, New York, in Queens. And um, I was actually one of three brothers. And my brothers were both born in Albany, but we happened to be in New York at the time. My parents, my father was working for a architectural and engineering firm. So I'm a city boy. <laughs> cool. Can you share with us some of your childhood memories back in Astoria? Oh, sure. Um, we started, my grandfather was a restaurant owner and he owned two Chinese restaurants, actually one in the Bronx and one, one in Chinatown and he had other business interests. And then my mother was from a laundry family. So, and she was also had grown up in the Bronx uh, where she met my father. They went to Bronx High School of Science. And so as a child, um, when we were in New York, I would go around with my grandfather to the restaurants and businesses. And then even later on, when we moved up to Albany, New York, my parents wanted to raise us out of the city. I would take the train alone as a kid from Albany to New York City to Grand Central Station. And I'd walk through Manhattan and I'd find my grandfather down in Manhattan or my uncle down on, he was a graphic designer. And so I kind of grew up walking around the city and then also in the suburbs of Albany. So um, at length, you know, it was, it was a great time to be a kid, I think. Um, we were one of only, you know, four families that moved in at the end of our suburban street in Albany. And um, I think when I was in about kindergarten and we used to, I made the joke that nobody could tell us to leave because we were there first. You know, we said we belonged like racial pioneers. And in the city, in, in New York, that was a little different. Um, I'm happy to bring some of that back. My grandfather tried to buy property elsewhere and live, uh, but at that time, early 1900s, um, he was actually told no, that he was, you can't, we're not selling to you. So he stayed in a Chinese and Jewish neighborhood in the Bronx um, and pooled his money with other Chinese people through, through the G Family Association to invest in, in businesses. You know, common stocks weren't really available to him, I'd say. Um, he did register for the draft, of course. He paid his taxes. And some of my family were actually served in the military. We have four veterans. So, um, but New York City, um, you know, also my father tells me about um, there were segregated swimming pools that Asian Americans couldn't go into. So aside from the housing, you had segregation in public places in the same way that there was for African Americans. And, um, but um, still my father talks about growing up there and, um, playing stickball in the streets with all other kinds of kids. He had all kinds of friends. And, um, you know, then he was actually um, class president of um, student government at um, Bronx Science where he met my mother. So they were childhood sweethearts and married and they're still alive. Um, they've just had their 60th something anniversary. So uh, we're counting, each one gets a party now. So. Um, my childhood there to give you a little more, I'm just go, I'm being lengthy since we, so we had 90 minutes. Um, my childhood is this combination of um, being, I think we were one of only four Asian Americans at our elementary and junior and high school up in 
Albany, New York and Gilderland. And so when I would come back to the city to visit our family restaurants and our relatives in New York, I always felt a lot safer in Chinatown. And that's the place where I loved to be as a kid. So I think maybe that gives you a little bit idea. And um, also a lot of Americanization was going on. Um, I was raised, my grandfather told me that um, Chinatown is too small or New York, like Chinese should be able to go everywhere in America. And so he approved actually of my father's moving us to Albany. And then also with you should try or be anything you want. Um, I was not um, channeled or um, persuaded to be a major, you know, of any sort. I was free, always encouraged by my parents to do whatever I wanted. And that was a boldness that I appreciated very much and still appreciate to this day. So does that, <laughs> does that help a little bit? <laughs> yeah, okay. for sure. That's yeah. so interesting to hear about a hundred years ago, like the segregation of people of color with the, the white. And that was definitely an, um, yeah, like a time capsule that it's, yeah, going down in history. Um, yeah, up until the 1950s, even in New York, that was occurring. So yeah, it was um, not too long. It, it feels like not too long ago. For me, it's only a, you know a dozen years before I was I was born in '62 during the Cuban Missile Crisis in October, and so it doesn't feel that long ago to me. Um, we used to say we I used to think as a kid that because the civil rights movement was occurring in the 60s while I was growing up. And I used to naively think, oh, this will all be, you know, over the years, this will race, racial problems, they'll work themselves out in the United States. And then look at us now, um, there's more divisiveness now of a different sort, um, but I'm astonished or I, I had hoped for something a lot a lot nicer by this point in time. Um, as far as a writer goes, though, I have, it just there's just more to write about, and um, so I'm still at work. I could say, you know, jokingly. <laughs> it's wonderful to hear you're working on on this, and I'm wondering uh, with Astoria. I guess now it's um, a very mixed neighborhood. Back then, what kind of ethnicity mix was there? Yeah, it, Astoria was always mixed in ways, um, you know, and the neighborhoods change. Um, our neighborhood, and um, it's funny, I talk with people from the Bronx and from Queens and like our neighborhood in the Bronx was Chinese and Jewish when I was a kid. And then it changed, um, it became Hispanic and um, there's a, the restaurant that we used to own on the corner is still a restaurant, but now it has a sign on it, or it did, it said Comidas Chinas y Latinas. Um, and it was uh, two subway stops away from the old Yankee Stadium. So I've seen a lot occur, you know, and um, a lot of changes, movements, ethnic patterns. Um, I don't, uh, I, I guess you get used to that. The older you see, the less things stay the same. So. Yeah, it's so interesting. Um, and I, I remember you said you speak Spanish. Like, did you mm -hmm. grow up during childhood as well in your neighborhood? Or? I was um, during childhood. So I spoke a little bit of Cantonese taught by my grandfather, um, but when we moved out of the city, I lost it because they didn't have Chinese schools in Albany, New York. And um, I've always missed it. And now I have a 10 year old daughter and in Columbus, at least they have Mandarin schools. So I've been thinking of taking her and picking it up myself. And, um, but Spanish, um, 
we had a pilot program in our elementary school. And so I actually had Spanish from fourth through 12th grade. And then um, in college, I took it also and, and did an independent study in Spanish for my doctorate. And of all things, we were in Guatemala um, where I lead service trips abroad now. Two years ago, we were there in a, in a remote village and the kids had never met anyone Chinese before. And then when I started to speak Spanish to them, they thought that was the greatest thing. <laughs> well, that, that's like the, the world these days of how global everything is, of course. Um, but I'll, I'm looking forward to heading back there when the pandemic is over or when it's safe to travel again. So. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, and like learning about your grandfather's history, like you said, they first moved here in 1908. Um, can you share with us some of the stories they might be telling you about like how it was back then? Sure. Um, I know that he came here as a student on a student visa. It was, uh, it was called uh, not a visa back then, but a certificate of identity. And I've seen his and it's Mark student. And then the ironic or the humorous thing is that he never um, went to school. He arrived here and he just started working. Um, so, and he, my, he came through Angel Island in California and worked his way ac across the country to New York City. Um, and he started working as a waiter and worked his way up to cook and then to ownership. And one of the unique things I found out when I was older is that he was a founder of the G Family Association in Chinatown. And we've actually been to the building and we told them who my grandfather was and they said, oh, you have to come here. And they showed us a plaque on a wall and I didn't know, but then it was, a, it was the history of the association and he was at the top. They considered him one of their founders and um, um, were happy that, and, and it was a, a family association called the Tong, but not in exactly that mafia type way or Hollywood way, but still there was one story my father told me that, um, at one point, my grandfather went into business with some other restaurant investors in a, they invested in a restaurant in New Jersey. And my grandfather heard they were doing really well and he didn't think, he thought they were cutting him out of the profits a little bit. So he did bring them back to the G Family Association for the ruling on this. And the ruling was, you have to give Frank G all of his money back and then you can never do business in Chinatown again. So there were some, you know, the family association back then could be pretty tough. Um, you know, whether they were mobsters or anything, I, I don't think um, I would have, my father would have known and I would have known about that. It was, that would have been difficult to hide. But um, he took me with him um, to businesses, we would go uh, into restaurants, into kitchens, he would say hello. Um, he owned properties, sometimes we would go and get rent. Um, he was just showing me his life and um, that, that he became a successful businessman, came here with nothing. And it really is that stereotypical side of the um, Asian American dream, you know, of, the, the model minority side. And of course, there's the other side that I was made very aware of. We had other members of our family who were not model, you know, success stories like that. Um, even my mother's family, her father had a tough time as a laundryman. And um, especially when he lost his wife, he had to take care of four, you know, four kids and struggled to do it. So, um, yeah, I don't, um, I don't traffic in the model minority stereotypes. I'm much more 
Well, no, we have to look out for all of Asian America and be very aware to not be misled um, by politicians who just point to the one side. Um, and I, I would think that, you know, many would classify me as the model minority. Um, you know, started out in my own field, have, have been fairly successful in English. Um, there are only four Chinese American males in the country who are full professors in English who write creative writing, who write prose, fiction or nonfiction like I do. So I'm very aware of how scarce we are. And so I don't, I don't think, um, you know, it's a commonplace thing at all for us to achieve. I, I, you know, I would say, no, I should, you know, I should be the first of many, you know, if, if that's what people want to do. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for doing this groundbreaking work as Asian American in the creative writing field. And uh, next, I was just wondering, um, with your father's side, you said he was a good student. He was a class president, um, but decided to go back to the grandfather's business on uh, restaurants. Like, um, oh, it, well, that's that's different. No, he didn't. Um, this is a good story. I'm glad you're bringing it up. Thank you. It's uh, my father grew up cooking in his in my grandfather's Chinese restaurants, and he thought that's what he was going to do for his entire life. And but when my father was a junior in high school. My grandfather said to him, you've earned your way to college from all the work you've done. I don't want you to be a cook in the restaurant. So why don't you to apply to college? And my father um, had, was so surprised by it. He hadn't thought about what he would apply for. And so he simply went to a, a guidance counselor at Bronx Science and they just told him, well, I think you'd be a good engineer. <laughs> and my father, really not having known freedom that way, said, oh, okay. And so he applied to be a, and he went to RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, and studied to be a civil engineer. And he, that's what he did for his whole life. He designed bridges and then some building work for the state of New York Department of Transportation. Um, and so when I was a child, sometimes he would take us for a drive and I'd say, where are we going? And we'd drive like two, three hours out of Albany. And all of a sudden he'd pull over to the side of the road and go, this is my bridge. He'd show us, this is a bridge I designed. And we'd look at it and say, okay, that's, a, that's pretty cool. Um, but he, um, I asked him later on, this is the better part of the story, um, you know, is that really what you wanted to be an engineer? Like if you could do it all over, what would you, what would you do? He said, actually, what I really would have done, my dream job would have been to be an oceanographer or an astronomer. And I think of those two jobs they're so um, more romantic in ways, you know, gazing at the stars, discovering constant, you know, planets or stars or, or exploring deep sea, you know, discovering species of fish or plankton or things. And, but he was a practical engineer his whole life. He took care of the family. So from my point of view, he was, um, you know, very strong like breadwinner, um, not the stereotypical weak Asian American male, but very, uh, very family oriented and um, just a, a really great father and, and encouraged me in sports of all things, which I was a little Asian American kid <laughs> growing up in the white suburbs, but I still competed. I didn't, I didn't get beat up or anything. Um, one story that I could tell you about this makes me remember is that my grandfather, before he got married, he would take vacations. He would leave New York City. And 
I, I have pictures of him like dressed up in a suit and tie and a fancy hat, carrying a suitcase. And he liked to go to Maine. And, you know, this is like in the 1930s and 40s. And he would go to, uh, to the beach in Maine and eat lobster and stay in hotels. And uh, I can't imagine being brave enough to do that in America at that time, but he did. And I think there are even some hints of that he had some romances with white women in Maine during his vacations and um, which surprises me uh, even more. And it's the sort of thing that makes me want to, you know, write a story. But um, he had met, um, he did meet my, my grandmother who was Chinese and married her. And she was from money, from Mandarin. She was actually from wealth, more wealthier family. And the joke was that uh, she drove him to be successful, <laughs> much more successful than he was because she was accustomed to growing up in style. Um, we have photographs of her um, riding motorcycles or going on airplane rides, which are um, much more adventurous than you'd think. Um, so again, not the stereotypical view of Chinese on one hand from her side. So, um, oh, I have one more story I'll tell you uh, about history. So my, my paternal, um, grandmother. Um, at one point, we learned that she had had a brother who disappeared. And we didn't know why. Um, and we just recently discovered through genealogical research that, you know, my grandmother and her brother were together in California, and then he disappeared. He actually ended up in New York City also. And my grandmother did not know this, but he married an African American woman in 1940 and became a taxi driver. So we have African American relatives in our Chinese family. And we're just beginning to look into contacting them. But um, that he disappeared, he might have been thought the family wouldn't accept that. Um, and that, those were the times we grew up, grew up in. Um, but um, we're gonna look forward to meeting with those family members. We find it, it's fascinating, so. Um, yeah, I trust back then, uh, like multi-ethnic uh, like marriages or relationship wasn't common at all. Right? No, no, so, um, and my, even my mother used to joke with me um, she used to say, um, you know, are, are you going to marry a nice Chinese girl? <laughs> and um, all of us, are, all of my siblings, I have um, two brothers and an adopted sister now. We all have interracial marriages. So it's, you know, we, got, we all have had interracial relationships. And so, um, um, Mom loves all the grandchildren just fine though, you know, I could say. Uh, so she, she just jokes about it back then. She still jokes about it with us. Um, I think I could show you for fun. Uh, let's see how this comes through on the interview. This is me and my daughter. <laughs> so. Wow. The, family, the family resemblance is very strong. <laughs> so, yeah, um, she's 10 now, that's Willa. So, yeah, yeah. What, other, what other questions do you have? Oh yeah, absolutely. I have like lots of questions. I'm really curious about your childhood upbringing and your, all your experiences. And you said uh, like you were a child and wondering, around in, in New York, was it safe to do so back then? Because like, I heard 60s, 70s, that was like gangsters. <laughs> yeah, there were rough, um, you know, you think about Times Square and everything wasn't cleaned up. 
And I think I was just fortunate. You know, I just had a sense of, you know, obviously don't be walking around at night. And, but, you know, all those things about, you know, um, make sure your wallet's buried deep in your pocket. And I was fat, I could, I was really fast. I could have run away from anybody. But no, I just, I managed to stay out of trouble and I'd never let my child go alone walking around the city now. And I was doing this in junior high school. I think I was like 12 years old, riding the train down alone. And <laughs> it, it amazes me now. And I'd go to comic book conventions. I read um, Marvel comics, you know, and I would love to go. And I'd just find where the com convention was in the hotel and I'd go. And now those conventions are huge with all the Hollywood actors and everything. But um, back then really just focused on comics. So yeah, uh, I was a city kid with many, I loved basketball, um, um, comic books and baseball. I, I pitched in little league and um, you know, and, and then I was a runner um, and I loved to run and I actually still run. So um, I would say, um, with a younger daughter now, I have to stay in shape, so I keep running. But yeah, New York City was, um, I would go uh, walk down from our apartment down to the, the restaurant. And even then though, we were careful, like it was just down a block and then down downhill to the bottom, 167th Street under the subway line, but we would be careful. And then, like I said, that's why I think I always felt safest in Chinatown. Um, but that was territory back then. There wasn't, you know, my grandfather was like, well, there aren't Chinese restaurants here in the Bronx. And now I remember he had two, two in the Bronx and then interest in restaurants in um, Chinatown. And then he owned a um, noodle factory um, that was down in um, Chinatown. He had some um, things. There's a photo actually of that's a, a kneading machine for dough. Um, and that was on Walker Street. And you can see these are the workmen folding sheets of noodles. And um, that, that business closed, but um, that was a fascinating time. I can show you the, here's the storefront, the China Noodle Company. So, yeah, he diversified his business interests, um, you know. And then when we had a house in the suburbs up in Albany, he would come up and he loved it that my father planted fruit trees, had some apple trees and, and a few peace trees. And that was a sign that um, to my grandfather who had been a farm from a farming family in Hoisan and Canton province originally, that we had made it, that he could, you know, come across the ocean. And then we had family land here where he could go pick an apple from a tree. And so I think he really loved that. Oh, the other thing is the work ethic. So he did not take vacations much at all, rarely. And in later life, he would work seven days a week. And then later in life, um, when um, in retirement, we could get him to go to Cape Cod with us to the beach. And that was a return to the ocean for him from his young days in Maine. And so he enjoyed that. <laughs> um, eating lobster, having fried clams, and just being on the ocean, I think. Um, so we did finally get him to relax. And he loved, it was the typical patriarchal thing. He loved that there were three boys in the family. And my mother really wanted a girl. So we adopted my younger sister from Korea. So we, she, she wasn't gonna take a chance by having a fourth child. So we adopted to make sure. So, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. And how are your brothers doing? Like, are they also, uh, did they stay in New York or did they move around? So I have an older brother who's an opera conductor and a 
um, piano accompanist, and um, he teaches privately in Salt Lake City, Utah, and um, has many students who win competitions and prizes. And then my younger brother stayed in Albany, New York, and looks after my parents, and he's uh, an accountant. He's an auditor with the state of New York. And then my sister works for a, a medical um, business in Buffalo, New York. So you have two artists and then two more, uh, I would say grounded um, siblings. Um, and it's really, um, it's interesting to see how now that we're older in our 50s and 40s, how we all want to keep close this family the way our parents raised us. And so I like that Chinese sentiment that family means everything or more than anything, old, old fashioned, but we still abide by it. We, we think it's very important. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like food, it's also really important in terms of family. And I'm curious, what do you grow up eating? Like you, your grandfather owns a restaurant that must be really important. So um, I think I had a really lucky childhood. Um, what would happen is my mother would cook during the week when I was in school. And she would cook all kinds of Americanized things. So I got that side, but then my father, since he had been a cook in the restaurant, he would cook Chinese food all weekend. And then since we were always going back and forth between Albany and Chinatown, there, it's a three hour drive and visiting my grandparents down there, we were always bringing back Chinese food from Chinatown, ducks, chashu bao, you know, dan tat, all of the things that, you know, dim sum. And, and so uh, it was all very, it was a rich childhood for me. Um, you know, and, and those are the things I love to this day to eat you know, everything and, um, and family banquets in Chinatown. You know, uh, I think I went to one uh, the year before the virus hit for my co a cousin in Chinatown. I still have a cousin who lives in Chinatown, New York in Confucius Towers, Confucius Plaza. And um, so we, she keeps up with the restaurants there, but we still like to all meet in New York. And um, in Atlanta, there's Chinatowns. And then when I lived in Houston, we'll have to talk about the Houston part. Uh, I went, you know, the old Chinatown and downtown, much smaller, but so I would actually go to the Houston out in Bel Air a lot. <laughs> so my con and other restaurants. Um, and then there was a restaurant, a friend of mine had a restaurant called Canton Seafood on Richmond um, Ave out uh, Montrose Way, closer to Montrose and uh, Richmond and Kirby it was on. And that's no longer in business, but we would go there for seafood all the time. And a place I can't remember, this wonderful woman had a restaurant on like Vietnamese down um, downtown near the, um, where um, the Rockets play. Um, <laughs> but- uh, The National Stadium? Is that, and yeah. Is yeah, I, I, it's probably gone. I mean, she was at the end of her, her years. And so um, I haven't looked to see, I, I'd have to ask old friends and see, oh, is this restaurant? I'd have to get the name back. But um, I, I thought the strip mall um, culture of Chinatown in Houston was a wonderful thing. It, it was, it was um, I was fascinated by it and cheered up by it because it was community all the same, you know, um, the dim sum and everything. And I would bring American friends, uh, I would say uh, Caucasian American friends and Latinos, everybody, they would ask me, where can we go? And we would meet in Chinatown on Sundays <laughs> in Houston. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm curious how you would compare the Chinatown in New York and here in Houston. Um, I, I just, I think that the food is equally good. And um, I was able to go to a lot of family banquets in New York um, for weddings, for, for my family. And so I didn't go to that many. I, I think I went to the G Family Association dinners in Houston. And those were, I felt so grateful to be able to meet other G family members, even if it was in name. Um, but, um, you know, I, I just think the food is equally good. That's part of the fun of it is going and, and, and finding restaurants and, and also the Chinese markets to have things to cook at home. I cook some um, and need to cook more. <laughs> so my father's videotaped his recipes. Some, some of his dishes cooking things, he's videotaped for us and given us the ingredient lists so that we can continue to do that. But he's the thing, he's a restaurant cook. They don't write things down. A lot of times he just knew in his head how to make lobster Cantonese or, you know, and then Chinese American thing, lo mein, or just, he could just do it in his head so easily. Um, but we said, please write down some of the things you use, some of the secret things. And he's done that for us. Yeah. Yeah, those are amazing. And I, I, I wonder if you're willing, we, we love to archive some of your family recipes in the in our box. Um, for well, I'll, I'll ask, he'll be happy to. That'd be um, great, thank you. Yeah, I think he's 83 now, but he's still very sharp. Um, Still does volunteer work. So um, sure, I, I'd be happy to do that. I'll ask him, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I guess um, I'm also really curious about Chinatown back then in New York, like in the 60s and 70s. Would you be able to like memorize and take us through a trip, uh, like a walking tour on, on, on Chinatown just quickly, like what you remember, the smell, what you would hear back then, like when you were walking on the street of Chinatown, what route you would take kind of thing? Sure, the, the three key streets in New York's Chinatown are Mott, Doyers, and Pell. And everything, you know, at one point, Chinatown expanded. Um, and most of the businesses that we went to are gone. They've changed. Um, now there are a lot, you know, still Cantonese, but more Mandarin businesses and Sichuan and other, other provinces have come in. And then now there's all this development, this gentrification going on where they're taking the buildings and buying them up. And I think there are some limits, fortunately, that have been restrictions have been put in place, but you really can't, um, oh, I know a story I'll tell you. So back then, um, community was so strong for my parents' wedding. Um, and so they're in their 80s and they were married in their 20s. So this is 60 years ago. Um, so we're talking in 19, you know, uh, well, 1950s, we're talking late 1950s. Um, their wedding last, the reception lasted several days. And because they were from restaurant and laundry families, even for the night they were married, they couldn't fit everybody into one restaurant. So, oh, uh, <laughs> there would be like one restaurant was where the uh, immediate family from bride and groom were, another restaurant were from out of town family who had come in for the wedding. And so my parents would go back and forth during the evening and greet the guests. <laughs> it was that large. And then so another night was for um, a celebration for all restaurant families who knew my grandfather. Another night was from laundry business families from my mother's side. 
And so just a lot more uh, celebration. And I think now they say they don't do it because it's too expensive. And they would also have many courses on the day, on the menu. You know, we're talking a 10 course meal. And now you go, and some still do it, but now some can be a little smaller, six, seven courses. Still very nice. And, and I grew up in the age of when people had shark's fin soup, which has now been banned for, to, to help preserve uh, the shark population. Um, although I hear that they might uh, do some restricted slot fishing or something and then um, keep that going somehow. But um, So yeah, the Chinatown back then, um, you had a little Italy to the north. And of course, rents were cheap back then. This is the other part is that it was an undesirable area of Manhattan, so you could afford to open a business. Now, if you look at the price to buy an apartment in Chinatown, New York, things are, I think the, I looked the other day, I think the cheapest thing is like $600,000, you know, and the typical one, that's a, that's a rundown place where the nice, nice things are 750 to a million. And that's even with the pandemic occurring. So, um, yeah, Chinatown had its, heyday and then um you know um we'll see about how it comes back from the pandemic that's a very interesting thing too and i hope to be as soon as it's all right i'll go <laughs> i'll go you know we have a vaccine i'll i'll fly to new york and meet family and have a meal um, and support some chinatown businesses so that's how, that's my love for uh, Chinese community, I would say. So yeah. I hope that answers, I hope that answers the, the question. Yeah, absolutely. They are so like vivid and I'm really grateful for that. And I'm also curious, were there any cultural traits in your upbringing that you realized that were Asian and not until you like grew up older that you realized they were Asian traits? Um, sure. Um, I write about this in my book of essays. Um, I think we were really raised to be, um, to be obedient towards our parents and a lot of things, um, although I've said that, um, you know, we were encouraged to do anything, become anything we wanted. I think still as immigrants, children of immigrants, you have that ex expectation. It's almost unspoken to do well, you know? Um, at the same time, I'll tell you the, this funny story. When I, when I got into graduate school, my, you know, MFA in creative writing in Iowa, my father, he didn't know much about it. And he did some research and he just said to me, I don't know how you got into that school. It's really competitive. Because I had been an athlete in high school. I wasn't, I didn't have super A grades. This is the other thing. I was like a B student, 80, high 80 average. I was not your typical overachieving, stereotypical Asian student. And so he said, how did you get, I don't know how you got into that school, but if you need money, I'm, I'll make sure you can afford to go. And I love to tell that story about how supportive of he was, even though it was in English and creative writing that my degree was for. And then I think later in the week, I told them, no, it's okay. I got offered a uh, graduate assistantship. I don't need money. Um, they're gonna take care of, I earned my way. And um, which um, he was even more pleased by, or, and he celebrated, so. Um, so we ne we've never had, you know, my parents never said, oh, I wish you'd have been a doctor or I wish, you know, but they did tell us, they were very realistic with us, said you need to always be able to grow up and support yourself and take care of yourself, um, which is of course is just good parenting. Um, closeness between siblings, very much so. 
um, we were raised that way. And um, I think um, also to maintain, so I have um, three um, uncles on my mother's side and we were always raised to be close and we do, we keep in contact with them and my cousins. So just the, the notion of family being important. And now as my parents get older, um, I, you know, we will take care of them. Um, my wife's mother-in-law lives with our family now and she's 80. And my wife is thrilled that I'm okay with that. And I said, well, I grew up in a Chinese family. So I was programmed to take care of my elders, you know, like the, to be good to them. And so uh, um, we, we laugh about that. But it really is like I have no problem with an elderly relative living under the same roof and taking care of them. And if at some point one of my parents needs to be taken care of, that we we do the same for them. So that's the traditional part. You know, do you have the same upbringing or some of the same things? Yeah, like the family value about like respecting the elders for sure, and like taking care of them as well as yeah that um very um yeah like family bonding is so close and so important in, in the culture um yeah and moving on oh you have a question oh. oh we were told not to get into trouble yeah that too. Yeah, to be well behaved <laughs> not, not to you know my my mother was so nice i remember saying once if anybody ever wants to fight you, she'd say, run like H-E double toothpicks. She couldn't even say run like hell. But I learned to, to be older to not back down. I am actually probably more aggressive than some Asian Americans that I've known. So I, you know, uh, no, I, I drive a truck. Um, <laughs> I'm not, you know, I, I go fishing all the time. I actually um have been hunting with friends so i do many things whatever i want to do i do it is uh there are no limits to what uh we should do if we want you know if it, it's playing rock and roll electric guitar whatever you know uh, beyond other things too so <laughs> Yeah, that's really encouraging and the way to do it. Like as Asian, we shouldn't be held back and we should do whatever we want to do. Um, <laughs> and uh, I guess moving on, can you share with us some of your college experience at Iowa and um, what kind of clubs, social activities you were involved with? Like you said, sure. Yeah. Um, I went for my Bachelor of Arts in English teaching to the University of New Hampshire of all places. And I was at the time one of only 20 minority students on a campus of over 10,000 students. And so um, that was different. <laughs> um, but um, I just got along. I did, I had a lot of friends. Um, I would say, um, I even joined a fraternity my last two years to, to see, and I really wondered about that, if it would, it would be possible, but I was actually accepted. And then the next year, two African-Americans joined the fraternity. So our fraternity was not, you know, like we didn't haze and we, um, not in any of the cruel ways, we drank a lot and, and had parties, but, um, we were not racist, which was really surprising. And this was 1982, 1983. Um, and, um, but, and that's, I know I'm not supposed to be part of that as a professor, unless it's anti, um, but it was a good, I, actually all the people that I went to school with, they're now doctors, you know, and, and in a fraternity lawyers uh, accountants, they run companies, they're really respected people. Um, that was just a silly fun time in life more than anything. And nobody, we joke around, nobody got hurt, um, which is very true. Nobody, you know, and so uh, 
but I, I took a class with a, a writer named Thomas Williams and he was a National Book Award winner. He had published 10 books and that was as a junior. And then I knew, uh, I said, I want to do this for a career. I really want to write and you know maybe not be a high school teacher um, because this is what I love to do is the writing and um, I've pursued it and managed to make my living at it ever since I, I wanted to be a creative writing professor. So he encouraged me and another writer named John Yount uh, during my senior year, they said, you should apply to college. And we went to Iowa and if you want, we'll write recommendation letters for you. And that's what I ended up doing. I went to um, the University of Iowa in 1987. And I studied with the writer James Allen McPherson, who's the first African American to win the Pulitzer Prize in fiction. And he passed away uh, a few years ago and I'm actually now his designated biographer. He became my mentor. And so I'm working on his biography now. And that will probably be another three years of writing. It's, it's a, a serious um, documented book. Um, and from there, 87 to 89, uh, I taught high school after that. Um, and then I moved, I wanted to come back and get a doctorate. And that's how I ended up in Houston in 1994. Um, came down to study at the creative writing program at UH. Um, the people I studied with were uh, Chitra Diva Karuni, who is still there. And um, Roselyn Brown was a novelist who's there who moved to Chicago. Um, wonderful poets were there, Edward Hirsch. Um, and also um, the African-American um, theorist, Lawrence Hogue, who is still there, who I still, he's a mentor figure to me and I still look, still communicate with him and he's gonna retire this year. So um, Houston, um, the educational part of Houston for me was a wonderful experience. Um, I edited, while I was a grad student for the literary journal Gulf, Gulf Coast and worked my way up from reader to assistant editor to editor to associate editor to editor of the whole magazine, then went on to the board and now I'm on the national advisory board. I joke, put out the pasture. But, um, but um, that was a great learning experience about publishing for me. Um, and I think I use those editing skills to this day in my job now because I edit two imprints. Uh, we publish um, novels and essay collections. So um, one imprint is called 2040 Books, the other is DLJ Books. Um, it keeps me um, busy, I say. Um, um, the my dissertation at UH was a novel about rail, Chinese railroad workers. And I, have, I am actually came back to that book and have finished it. So that's about to go off to editors to see if, if we can find a home for it. And at the, at the time, that's a historical novel. In 1866, there were over 15,000 Chinese workers on the railroad, on the Central Pacific Railroad. And, uh, in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. And there are history books on it. There are three history books, but nobody's written a novel about it. So I hope to be first to market. And I would love to, a pipe dream is to bring Chinese actors acting jobs for film version, you know, or, or TV series or whatever. And I have a screenwriter who's, who wants to look at the book already. So we'll see what happens. I don't know. Those are, you know, um, when you don't like, don't count. I don't count chickens before they're hatched in, in publishing. Publishing is tough business. Um, Houston also, um, I should say, uh, I work with Dr. Yali Zhou and um, who's still at UH. And we founded an Asian American studies minor at UH. 
and I helped her with the curriculum from that for that she had the position and I knew the curriculum and we had a, a nice partnership and I taught so I got to teach graduate classes actually while I was a graduate student um, and, and it was mainly to undergrads um, but that was a great opportunity for me. Um, UH was, um, how can I say it? So I had never lived in a city as an adult before. So coming to Houston to work on a doctorate was um, a challenge for me, but a welcomed challenge. And um, I came thinking I'd stay from 1994 to 1999, but I stayed a decade from 1994 to 2004. I loved Houston. And what I say now is that I miss Houston all the time. Um, the friendships, the artistic community of Houston, that's a treasure. Meaning the whole, the literary scene with imprint, the um, music scene and um, just the art scene, it's so rich. Um, imprint, I have to mention, um, so the people I remember, Rich Levy, um, Marilyn Jones and Krupa Parikh were there. Um, I taught um, adult workshops for them. And um, one of the ones was a memoir workshop in one of the wards with uh, elderly African-American ladies. And that workshop still exists. Um, and so I, I had started that. Also, I started the novel workshop for Imprint. And Richard said, do you think it can be done? I said, well, give it a try. And that was the wonderful thing about Houston. It's so supportive of its artists. And, um, you know, that, that um, working, you know, those workshops were great for me as a graduate student, some extra income um, because of the vibrant Houston ref restaurant scene, you wanna be able to afford to eat out. Um, and uh, then just to make contacts, um, the support of Imprint was wonderful. Um, what they do for students at UH, they raise scholarship money and um, fund, fund reading and run a beautiful public reading series downtown and now online for this year. But I, I, I definitely wanted to mention Imprint. Um, then when I graduated, um, I wasn't ready to leave. I still loved Houston. I was the director of development for Writers in the Schools. And at the time, the executive director was Robin Riegler, who recently uh, uh, resigned from the position. She just was ready for a change. Um, she was wonderful to work with. And Long Chu, who uh, he, um, I think, works for one of the foundations in Houston. He um, oversees grants. And, um, but um, Bao Long Chu is, is who that is. And, um, I used to joke that he was my cousin, uh, even though he's Vietnamese. Um, and um, yeah, we, uh, that was an education on writing grants. And we went, we took uh, writers in the schools and grants from over 750 grand to up to about a million and a quarter while I was there. And, I use that even on my, my job now. I just, I love to write grants sometimes for uh, worthy causes. Uh, and then I taught at Tomball College um, and it was a community college. Now it's, I, I think Lone Star College, it's evolved. Um, so I did all, the, all those things um, before leaving in Houston. And then there was one other job. I worked in venture capital and this is while I was the director of development at which I had two jobs. I don't know how I did. It was like a job and a half. But I wrote business plans for emerging and mid mid growth businesses. Um, one person I should remember who I worked with at Gulf Coast Literary Journal was Marion Barthelme, who has passed away since, but she uh, became our board president. And she used to joke with me that when she first met me in Houston, I was like a boy, but then I left like a man. 
because she saw how much I grew while I was in Houston. And, and I, I still think like that for anybody who moves there, that's what Houston is. It's this rich community where you can find us, be welcomed and um, people are so generous and you, you can make it, you know, you can find a job and um, share in things. And it's so diverse. Was it the second most diverse city in the country? Yeah, well, the, the most diverse. the most now. Yeah, see, when I was there, it was a second. I knew it was like one or two. Yeah, with over it, when I left, there were like over four million people. And is it still up at like four and a half, or is it gone to? Yeah, you know, just this this scene of I think it's at over four and a half million people now. So. That's when I think of Houston, um, the multicultural nature of it. Um, I loved Houston compared to Dallas. <laughs> you know, you, you'd be in Texas and Houston's like an oasis in Texas. And of course I explored the rest of Texas. I went fishing down along the Gulf Coast, um, all the way down to the Mexico border. Um, I went up into West Texas and Austin and went hiking there and, and visited friends and, and Austin was a wonderful city, but for me, my favorite remains Houston. You know? um, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's I think how I'd like to put it. That's amazing to hear how involved and invested you are with the Houston community. Um, I, I was wondering when you first moved here in 1994, was there anything that's new and surprising to you, like the Southern culture scene and Southern food, hopefully? Um, I was so naive. You know, I, I had a, uncon a vehicle without air conditioning. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'll be all right. I'll just drive with the windows down and I'll be frugal. And I quickly, learned that wasn't possible within about a week because I arrived in like August. And um, so I had never lived in the South like that before. And, um, but um, Houston at that time, um, oh, I, I lived on um, oh, apartments, the Bank Street apartment. Um, Wait a minute, I'd have to remember. Um, most of the time for the longest part in Houston, I lived in an apartment on Hawthorne Street. So, um, and it's um, down um, across from, uh, past the Starbucks on Hawthorne and Kirby, heading um, toward UH. So that would be, I think heading, um, let me do geographically. <laughs> Uh, whether that's east or west, but um, the neighborhood was a lot cheaper then. Um, there wasn't, you know, it was up and coming, but it was um, still, um, there was room and, and things were affordable. Um, rent was like 300 a month, you know, 300. And now you couldn't. And my regret was having stayed 10 years that I didn't buy a place when I arrived. Because now, of course, I've seen what's happened to real estate in Houston since I left. And I left 16 years ago. And things seem much more crowded to me. Um, when I, when I, co I come back to Houston about every other year. Um, so, uh, but a lot of the places, as much as they've changed, some of them, you know, are, are still there, or some of the things. And, um, I think the culture was, I don't know, with creative writing, I think it's the same scene. It's as welcoming and it's as supportive because all, you know, writers from Houston will friend me on Facebook or something. And I read about them doing the same things that I did. You know, they'll read in the graduate reading series at Brazos Bookstore. You know, oh, that's, that's another person I should mention. So when I was in Houston, um, Carl Killian, um, the Killians owned Brazos Bookstore and they were really wonderful people. 
and I, I think Carl retired and, and took a position working for uh, um, the Menil collection. There was one year I had a Menil house. I rented a Menil house across from the Rothko Chapel. And that was again special, like more of the um, uniqueness of to be in Houston and just, you know, where else could you be a graduate student and go and walk into free museums <laughs> and free, free exhibits and see the Cy Twombly Gallery or the Rothko Chapel or, and just, you know, or, or go over to the MFAH. Um, and even the Houston Symphony had free tickets, you know, at the end of the evening for grad students. And I would go get those. Um, so, uh, yeah, that would just, um, I think those things are, remain the same, or I hope they do. <laughs> it's wonderful to hear that you had such a vibrant life here in Houston back then. Um, and go going back a little bit, like, how did you get into creative writing? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think um, it was from taking a college course, but I'd always read. Um, it, once I got to college, um, I became a voracious reader. I was an athlete before high school and everything. I really didn't read so much. And so when I got to college and I took lit courses, I found that I, I love to read book novels. And I would go to the library and just read for hours. And I felt like I was catching up. And I still feel like I'm catching up. Like even now I'm 50, I still like, if I was to show you in the back of the room here, there's stacks of books that I have that I haven't read that I've ordered or, or you know, and have had sent to me. And um, so I think it is um, artistically, there's still, a great satisfaction from completing an essay or a story and having felt like I've said or done what I wanted to. Like I said, I, you know, I reach a level where the language is good enough and the plot is unique enough or I've explored the subject enough. And for me, that's what I wanna keep doing, you know, Till I retire, I'm really I I I've never tired of that. Uh, that feeling has never gotten old of finishing something. And it, and it's rare with a long book, so I'm always working on something you know also short while I work on longer pieces so that you have that satisfaction of finishing something. If you go long too long without it, it's not good. It, it's um you know uh, um. It's like one of those things, like uh, passions in life. Like if, I love to fish, so if I don't go fishing for too long, I don't feel right, you know. Or I guess it would be like going without ice cream or something like that, you know. <laughs> so I hope that I hope that answers the question. So I'm one of those rare happy people where in college I realized what I wanted to do and I've been doing it ever since. But I have met writers who I knew, they say when, from the time I was a kid, I wanted to be a writer and I'm envious for them, you know. I knew as a freshman in college that I wanted to work in the field of English. So um, I, I just loved language or the sounds of words or how they, you know, putting them together. And, um, I, I don't know if I'm a natural, like um, a lot of times there's a lot of work and a lot of revision that gets to be done. Um, I, I also, I think I would have been happy being a, like a forest ranger, <laughs> a little bit of romantic occupation like my father. Um, but on the other hand, uh, um, I needed to make sure I could pay bills. So I was like, I thought I'd, going to teaching so um, I did have one teacher say to me when I was college like you better get serious or you know I don't know if you're gonna make it you know and I, I kind of laugh about that you know I was like no I'm a endowed professor now I think I made it you know but I, I did get serious 
you know, much more in graduate school. So, you know, if anything to tell other writers is like, you know, I, I work with these undergraduate writers and they want to know whether they'll make it. And I'm like, well, if you think you can, like, but, but you're too young to like call it right now, keep going, <laughs> you know. I'm only peaking now, I think in my fifties. Um, I sit down with an essay and I, I would say, you know, most of the time I know what I'm doing or I have a sense of it or a confidence that I never had in my thirties. Um, but essay writing became easier when I turned 50. I realized I'd had all these experiences and I hadn't written them down and they were just there. And then novel writing is going to stay difficult forever. <laughs> you know, the imagination making things work out. So I think, I hope that, yeah, I hope that answers it. Yeah, for sure. And let's talk a little bit more about your works. Um, the, you said the novel, which include The Iron Road, about the Chinese railroad workers and Far From the Beautiful Country, which is your dissertation. And the uh, more recently, the, the award-winning uh, that you won the Santa Fe Writers Project Literary Award, um, the work, uh, the book My Chinese in America, like all these books. Uh, that that, how has um, like your Asian uh, identity and like why did you choose to uh, like tackle this um, like kind of angle as well as the creative process? Can you tell us a bit about those? I'm um, happy to. Um, my Chinese America, um, I noticed that there hadn't been a Chinese American who, male who had published a book of essays for over a decade. And the last one was a writer named Frank Chen. And um, so I was like, there's obviously something needs to be said. <laughs> you know, things, there are things that can be said from this perspective. So I named the book, My Chinese America. And um, just as, cause my version of course is gonna be, I'm only gonna speak for me, you know, from my experiences, my Chinese American experience isn't, uh, I don't presume to speak for anyone else. Um, so yeah, I entered the book in the contest and uh, was really fortunate. The editor said he, wanted to publish the book. And um, I was lucky. I had got nice reviews from Publishers Weekly and Kirkus Reviews and the book's still in print. Um, then the railroad novel, yeah, the, um, the dissertation, it was called Far From the Beautiful Country when I was in graduate school. Now the title is The Laborers. So I've retitled it. Um, that just happens over time um, during the evolution of working on a piece. Um, and, you know, that's, that's like I said, in the process of going to editors. And then um, now um, I'm working on two books. One is um, called At Little Monticello, and um, that's a biography of my mentor. Um, James McPherson, and that's under contract with UGA Press already. And um, there's a foundation, the Hoge Foundation um, from Savannah is going to support the printing of the book. Um, and I'm excited to work with UGA Press. The editor, Lisa Bear, is wonderful. And, and then I'm also chipping away at another book of essays. And I don't quite know what the title would will be, it might be something like Multicultural Americana, but um, it's bigger, like My Chinese America was personal essays, and this next book of essay takes on larger subjects. Um, so that's kind of everything from as varied as going and visiting Lincoln's home, Abraham Lincoln's home, uh, to uh, Oh, I've been working on an essay about racial remarks that every president throughout history has made. <laughs> you know, that, that's a list essay of sorts, but you know, 46 presidents leads to 
46 paragraphs and a little commentary in between. Um, so that book will be, you know, you, you mine the personal territory, but then you, you want to branch out and do more commentary. But there'll be a few personal essays in there, you know, if, the, if they fit. Um, well, one of them, it, it's funny, one of them is about eating oysters. Um, I want to do an essay called Oyster Road, where I drive, I start up in Maine, and I work my way down the Atlantic coast, swing around Florida and, and go along the south, southern coast and end up in Texas at an oyster bar. And I really don't know what I'm going to find, but I want to like, write about a, a great oyster eating trip. And, and my mother loves to eat oysters, so I'll have her like come meet me at some point along the trip. You know, that kind of silly stuff, but adventurous, you know. And I'm sure there'll be some Asian um, restaurants that prepare oysters along the way. You know, some Asian chefs to talk with. But that'll be a, for when the pandemic improves, I think, you know. Otherwise, I'd have to have an RV or a motorhome to be safe for a trip like that. <laughs> Is that, you know, um, you know, I have, um, I'm 58. I have seven years till retirement. Could go longer, but um, if I think in terms of books, you know, I want to have at least five books when I'm done. Um, I do have another novel in me or two. And, um, you know, one that was, uh, uh, I've drafted about a, a restaurant in Chinatown, New York, like where I grew up. And it's about the lives of the um, the cooks and the waiters and the owner. And so um, hopefully that'll see the light of day. I don't know, but um, I'm like most writers. We have certain books that will never see the light of day and then some that manage to make it out. So um, yeah, it's, um, it's, not, it's not a sure thing, but, uh, but I like that. You have to keep proving yourself. Yeah, absolutely. It's a journey, right? Yeah, yeah, very yeah. much so. And I'm also curious about your friendship uh, and mentorship with uh, James Ellen McF McPherson, who um, you spoke about. And I'm curious, like, uh, like what you, did you guys talk about during your like decades of friendship and how um, it nurtured your writing? And I guess both. Uh, as people of color and minorities in this country, how has that, um, I guess, enlightened about the identity and the recognition? Sure. Um, James um, took me under his wing. Um, he said that since I wrote about working class people, that we work the same side of the street. He liked that I wasn't snotty or arrogant, I guess. and. Um, the first year of mentorship, he would give me a book every other week or so, and I'd read the book and we'd go back to his house and talk about it. And um, in a nutshell, I think that the, the thing is that um, he taught me to be a voracious reader. Um, he read everything from the Greeks to current, through up through American history, constitutional history, and then current cultural criticism. And he would ask me, what are you reading? He was so wonderful in that way. I mentioned at one point, the French theorist Baudrillard. And the next thing I knew, James had quoted Baudrillard in an essay, like six months later. He was phenomenal. Um, he was also an Omni-American. And um, that's a book by Albert Murray and in the best sense of the word, James never used it as a weapon, the theory, but the theory is that um, we don't have to be, think of ourselves as minorities as becoming Americanized or anything because our contributions are, are already part of the culture. You know, whether it's Asian American, Asian cuisine or African American cuisine or African American music, you know, so, um, we don't have to like 
constantly feel like we have to belong because we already do as much as anyone. And I think that's the gist of that theory. Um, and I've always liked that. You know, it, it's a way of looking at the country um, that no, this isn't certainly not only a, a white nation, but it's a nation for everybody in it. And it, of course, you know, writing a novel about the building of the Central Pacific Railroad, I know that, that uh, how long Asian Americans have been here and, and how long Asians have contributed to, you know, the country's history. So um, whether anyone decides to teach it or not, you know, that's always um, the struggle. But for those of us who know better, you know, we're not, we will continue to teach as we see fit, you know, as, as we should. <laughs> so. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for teaching and sharing the story to more people to learn about our history. Um, and I, yeah. Um, James's books, I really want to mention. So he had a short story collection called Hue and Cry. And then he won the Pulitzer in 78 for a book of stories called Elbow Room. And it's just a wonderful story. And I wanted to write his biography to bring more attention to him as a writer. He's um, uh, should be read more. And he is beginning to get more attention, not just because of me, but because of his daughter and because of the efforts of other writers. So he also published um, a, a book of essays called A Region Not Home and a memoir called Crab Cakes. So, uh, and a book of essays called a uh, history book called Railroad. Uh, that was his editor was the famous writer Tony Morrison. So um, James um, has a lot of work that needs to be read. Uh, deserves to be read. So I'm happy to say that. Oh, did you want to talk about the election before we, you know? Uh, yeah, that's what I'm going for next. Uh, like you were talking about the elections and recording. <laughs> Like I am really excited to like ask you about like we are precisely one week after the election day. Like how are you feeling? And we also have our first um, minority um, vice president and women in the White House now. Like um, what are your thoughts? Um, everybody knows that um, I'm not a, I was not a Trump supporter. So um, my thinking is that um, uh, I do think it was time for a change um, that um, while, um, yes, and, and I have friends who are Republicans. So I, and as a teacher, I teach Republicans and Democrats. So it's really, I really listen, I, I have to listen to and I enjoy listening to both sides more than the average person. And, you know, I listen to Republicans who say the economy was going great, you know, and, and there'll be a, you know, a virus vaccine soon. And, but then I listen to the Democrats who the, the virus response was inadequate, too many people have died. And it was a deregulation economy, which wasn't the best thing for the land and the air and the water. I tend to be on the democratic side on this one. Um, I'm looking forward to a, a much stronger virus response. Um, I hope that we follow the practices of South Korea or Japan or even China and getting the virus under control um, so that the economy can be more successful for everyone. Um, more importantly too, uh, you know, when I hear the backlash, people saying, well, Democrats protested and rioted for four years. And so we're not gonna, we're gonna protest for four years with Biden. But I do think that Biden will speak to everybody more. Whereas I think Trump um, mainly spoke to his base, you know, um, and so, I think that's that's why he lost the election. And with all the protests going on now, 
I, I, I don't think there will be any finding by any US attorney of widespread voter fraud. This is typical Trump. Um, he, he is a battler in business and, and I actually understand that. That's how he made a success. That's how he runs his business. He, he fights things and um, if he loses, he loses, but he'll go down hard fighting. And, and that's, I can understand that actually. And, you know, I'm not gonna mock it or it's not my style, but I, I understand it. Um, we are in, since I am in Georgia, um, Georgia did go blue by, I think about 10,000 votes. Um, and so we're about to get an election blitz for the two Senate positions that are up. My phone is not gonna stop ringing in the evening now. <laughs> <laughs> from, from, from people campaigning for either side. And my phone is not gonna stop receiving text asking me if I wanna contribute to either, you know, contribute my time or make phone calls or give money to either cause. So for us in Georgia, politics continues. Um, we are still the center. And um, it's gonna be quite the race. There were 60% of um, voters, 65% turnout in the state. And the parties are gonna struggle to get the rest of that 35% out. And we're really gonna see a dog fight here. And I'm of a mind, I just, I hope that everybody votes. And I don't, you know, um, so I think it's an achievement enough to have turned Georgia in the, um, in the presidential election, but uh, I actually hope, yeah, I hope we flip the Senate seats so that it's easier for Biden to accomplish an agenda without resistance. Um, you know, we've had a, we've seen, you know, division so long, for so long. Um, one last thing. So the election, as close as it was, maybe a 5 million vote difference now, um, still, I think like, you know, the majority of this country is predicted to be multiracial by 2042. And so we really are going to struggle at, at this like 50-50 gap for the next 20 years. You know, so we have to learn to get along. I don't, I think it's too exhausting to fight for another 20 years. And, and so... I, I'm a, of a mind to uh, find like-minded individuals of either party who want to get along and spend my time with them. And I'm older and I, I really don't have time to, to be fighting. I need to be getting work done. So that, that's kind of how I view uh, the election in life right now. And how do you see this election could impact the future of representation of Asian in the po in politics and humanities in this country? Um, yeah, you saw the candidate Jeff Yang being nationally prominent for the first time this year and Kamala Harris as a vice president with uh, an Indian mother. So uh, there it is, an Asian American of, of um, is in, somebody of Asian American descent is in the White House now in one of the major uh, offices. So um, I've read the articles that talk about how as that slim margin, you know, 50-50, uh, the Asian American population in the country becomes even more crucial to swinging the vote one way or another. You know, and, and by and large, we all, I think 75% of Asians are democratic with um, maybe the largest veering towards Republicans or the Vietnamese Americans. Um, so, uh, you know, um, yeah, um, I think just the Asian American vote just becomes all the more important, just like everybody else's vote. And the communities need to do everything they can to get all, all the vote out, to get the vote out. Um, there's some wonderful there's a wonderful organization in Atlanta that does that for Asian Americans. And Jeff Yang is actually moving down to Georgia to help with the Senate races, he announced. I read the other day. 
So you can tell I'm up, I'm up on all these issues and best of the pandemic, we're in our homes, <laughs> become news junkies and, and follow the news. That's a side benefit, I think, if anything, I'm more informed than ever before. So how have you been since March, like the pandemic unraveled? Um, we're really in confinement. Um, Georgia was one of the first states to open. And I understood why the governor did it. He wanted the economy up and running. The Georgia budget has to balance every year and can't be debt. Um, and um, it's sad. I mean, this governor before the coronavirus had um, pledged raises to educators in the, in the, in the state, which um, I, I was pleased by that um, a Republican governor would, saw the need for that. Um, but I still think we opened too soon. We've been in the top six now in terms of caseloads and deaths in the country for our state, and we haven't improved. Whereas I've seen New York lower their percentages down to 1%. Um, I own a, a second home in New York. And I went there this summer for a brief time and, and got to see um, how different the culture is with mask wearing insisted everywhere versus not being ins insisted upon. And um, I, I'm an advocate for human life. <laughs> I value human life more than the dollar. Good if you can have both, but um, my business experience tells me that businesses can be rebuilt, but lives can't. Lives can't. So uh, we will see, you know, uh, you know, I would have rooted for Trump with, uh, if he had a strong response, you know, and I root for Biden to have a strong response. I just w want success for the country. So, you know, this is, you know, I gave Trump his chance, you know, and for me, it wasn't enough. Um, and I'll call out Biden the same if it's not enough, if things stay bad. So that that's part of, uh, you know, being fair. <laughs> and the process of democracy, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's all of my questions. Uh, thank you so much for bearing with me and answering all these very thoughtful and inspiring. Um, and do you have anything you would like to add before we close? Um. No, I'm just so grateful to have been able to, to talk with you. And um, I hope I answered everything with enough thoroughness. And um, yeah, I'd just say um, I loved my time in Houston. And um, I look forward to my visit uh, back to Houston every year uh, when I'm scheduled to, to fly in. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity to interview. Yeah, thank you. And don't forget to swing by Rice at some point on your visit. I will. Okay, we'll have to say hello. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. It would be great to meet you in person. <laughs>